I am Pastor Emma Rissi Virgil Sr., and I will be briefly narrating this small slice of rich history, The Bottom, Stores and Stories from West Jackson Street. <laughs> West Jackson Street has seen many changes. The bottom, as it was and is still known, is a historic district that had many thriving black, Greek, Jewish, and white-owned businesses. For blacks, the bottom was for decades a cultural and clean community. It was an orderly community and a safe community. But after a decline in the 70s and 80s, Many businesses closed and buildings eventually were abandoned. West Jackson Street was renovated in 2019 with input from many sectors of the community, including the arts community. In 2021, plaques were installed with the names and owners of businesses which once thrived in the bottom. Getting the plaques installed was the final step in a long process. Much work went into the research for the plaques. Local historian Jack Hatley got the idea while visiting Tulsa, Oklahoma. He saw plaques in the sidewalks commemorating black-owned business that were burned down in a racist incident in the 1920s. So I brought that back, and, and that was the beginning of it. So I laid it out there, and we started looking at all those businesses and was able to identify just about all the black business in the 300 block of West Jackson Street. A flourishing place does not happen by accident. Let's take a look at some of the threads of history that made the bottom so special in the hearts of many. Of course, as a pastor, you know I'm going to start with the church. I think history will agree with me that a thriving culture needs good reasons to do and to be so. Church was the center of the things for blacks because that was the only place we could go. Our church served as not only the place to come worship, but we could not go to restaurants. Uh, blacks weren't allowed in a lot of places that they didn't feel comfortable or that the cost was so whatever, that we, our restaurants was at our church. Another thread of history was the resort era in Thomasville. Wealthy industrialists vacation here and some moved to Thomasville. They bought farming plantations and made them hunting plantations around the 1890s. And you have this influx of industrialist money pouring into Thomasville and providing these really well-paying uh, jobs for the African-American community. That isn't to put any rose-colored glasses on, um, you know, or say that uh, there weren't very serious problems, but that they were not nearly as bad in Thomasville because of this confluence of all these uh, little details. Education has long been a top priority in Thomasville, which contributed to the quality of life for both blacks and whites. The noted and distinguished Allen Normal Industrial School provided in that era an excellent and superb second to none education for its students. The AMA relocated the Allen Normal School uh, from Quitman to Thomasville in 1886. Allen Normal at one point was ranked the, it's like maybe in 1910, 1912, was ranked the third best high school in Georgia. And they didn't know that it was a black school. And they pulled the ranking after that, but you can continue to see it in 
later generations of Thomasville. There's like just all these little things that layered on top of one another uh, that just made everything work to the point that, you know, here we are in 2021 and um, the Secretary of Defense comes from little old Thomasville, you know. And Thomasville's very proud, but also there's been so much success out of Thomasville also that I, I don't want to say it's expected, but it's like part of it sometimes feels expected. Like, yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. The shared experience of community is a mixture of the good and the bad, positive and negative, the successes and failures. During segregation, whites mostly shopped on Broad Street, while West Jackson Street, the bottom, was the street of choice for many black shoppers. As a teen, Walter Mariah did shop on both Broad and West Jackson Street. When you went in those places, it was like, man, get out of here. You know, hurry up and do what you came in here to do and get out. It was, it was always like you had eyes on you. When Harry Rayford opened the fly shop, you just lost all of that uh, fear. You could go in the fly shop, handle the clothes, Crime on everything. You didn't have this pressure from some white person. Don't want you. They want your money, but they don't want you in there. And it took me quite a while to just weave myself through and get past it. But you know, all of those things that we experienced uh, made us who we are today. During the 40s and 50s and 60s, the bottom was a blooming business section of Thomasville. The sidewalks would be filled with shoppers going in and out of stores. And we cannot talk about the peak of the bottom without highlighting the strong sense of family and community. This meant that kids and teenagers had more than two parents around at any yes. given time. I didn't have the freedom I would have liked to have because I had so many eyes on me for being young. And we were going to do just what our parents said because we, we was too well known in Thomasville to do anything different. Because everybody was your mama and everybody was your dad if they saw you doing something wrong or saw you in the wrong place. And everybody would talk to everybody. Even in my neighborhood, you know, if we were just a little bit late coming home from school, you know, people would say, well, and they would be not really trying to tell on you, but they will mention it to your parents that you were late coming home. When grown up asked you who your folks were, like who were your folks, you probably got caught doing something that you weren't supposed to. Before you got to get home, and there was no internet, there were no cell phones, a lot of people didn't have house phones, so how the news got across town so quick, I'll never know. I remember one time the teacher told me she was going to tell my mother something, I don't know, about my grades or something. And I just, every afternoon when I would come home from school, I would just, my, I, my heart would be throbbing. I was just really nervous because I didn't know whether the teacher was going to come and tell my mother. But I guess the teacher forgot, so she never came. So. <laughs> We had a sense of pride of owning our own stuff. So in the back of our minds, we knew about the discrimination of blacks and whites uh, not working together, that uh, blacks not getting what whites got, but we never walked around and talked about it all day. Uh, but at the whole time that I was growing up in Thomasville uh, as a child, I never felt underprivileged. You know, many of the individuals that owned those spots um, were not just in silos when they left those spots. Um, they attended church together. Uh, they were in various clubs together, social clubs. There were many businesses and stores located on West Jackson Street. Allow me to mention just a few. 
There was the Manhattan Coffee Shop. There was Corbett's Billiard Room. There was the Busy Bee Cafe. There was Dockett's Pharmacy. There was C.J. Thomas Pilgrim Insurance Agency. Many people remember Harry Martin, an entrepreneur who owned a shoeshine business and a restaurant named The Tasty Shop. But now most of the time with Mr. Martin, you went in, you didn't just hang out around the jukebox and stand there. If you wasn't spending some money, you, you, you had to be spending some money and, and especially not know it. He didn't like a noisy crowd. You can't come in there and just shoot the breeze with Bob. <laughs> he expects you to spend some money if you're now. You can't blame him. I mean, you know, he's open for business, and you are not bringing it. <laughs> My classmates and all, all the boys got kicked out of school one day, and I don't know what we did. I think I think something about there was a a big big uh, uh, they were selling pies. People can order. Pie, cake pies, what do you want to call it? Potato pies. And somebody ordered a whole batch of them and sent them to the principal's office. And that was somebody did something really wrong. But we don't know who did. Nobody admit to it. So, anyway, uh, so nobody admitted to it. So he, he punished us all. He said, we, we, you, you all need to, you, we walked off the campus. Mr. Frank Mars encouraged us to, you guys better go back and get in school. You, you should be better, you should, you be, should be more better than that. And that was entertainment to all of us. We would go down to the tasty shop and meet our friends. And that's about, that's about as far as I went to doing something. I didn't hardly go over to uh, that little restaurant next door to Dockett's because it seemed like that was more for older people. We didn't hardly go in there. And my mom worked there at the coffee shop, and that's where they met, met up. She actually worked for Mr. Corbett, which was two doors from the movie theater. Uh, there was a Mr. Chapel who had a barber shop, but this is the interesting thing about his barber shop. He only cut white men's hair, <laughs> but he had a thriving business. And my dad worked at the barber shop, White's barber shop, uh, uh, down on. Um, Jackson, East Jackson, the bottom, uh, West Jackson, I'm sorry, the bottom. Uh, yeah, it was, I guess it was a typical barber shop where the men got together and they did their talking and things of that nature. Gossiping, I guess you would say. Of course, you say men don't gossip, but they do. <laughs> they had little places on Oak Street and uh, we call them cafes or jib joints. And there was a doll's cafe used to be there. They would play music and stuff. And as little uh, kids and stuff coming up, when you saw those kind of places, we just always knew that they were just having all kind of fun in there. But there wasn't any quote unquote worried about danger. Uh, you could patronize the business, but you couldn't stay there and, and hang out. There was a on Stevenson Street where the amphitheater's at. That was where the juke junks was located at. That's where that you didn't go down there. You weren't you weren't a a, a part of the party person, you was too young, you didn't go down there. Then we had the old wine shop that was there for years there. And I, I believe Mr. Corbin might have owned it also, but the wine shop was there and, and uh, you never did see that many persons in and out of the wine shop because number one, it was for the adult. Being a little old 16 year old guy could go in there and buy wine, you know, it mustn't have no, I, I think about that sometimes. You know, how could we, you know, young people, did they sell us wine? We knew not to go into the wine shop because you went in there, mama was gonna know about it, dad was gonna know about it. But there was a white man owned the wine shop. I can look at him right now, he's, he's sort of short, heavy set, don't know his name. But we did, we, we, we got that, I forget what kind of wine it was, but anyway, we would buy it and mess around typical to what some kids do today. I hope they don't, let's put it that way. <laughs> I tell you, Mr. Hadley, this is your pastor. You really need to see me concerning this incident. I'm looking forward to you being in my office as soon as possible. 
But the place that stood out a lot to me that I guess nobody ever will ever think about it was uh, it was a Jew named Norman Goldstein Justo there. And that's where most of the black people would buy most of their stuff from that store because he would come around and bring you, I mean, no many days, he brought us a selection of clothes to the house. We didn't have to go down to the shop, like shoes and things. Um, there were several Jewish stores down here. My father spoke of those men, and, and one in particular, um, I think his name was Mr. Goldstein. Um, he would stand out in front of his business in the mornings, and uh, the first person he could grab and drag him in his business he was gonna sell him something every day because his day would not be complete, uh, would not be productive if he had not done that first thing in the morning. That's just his mindset. We used to go into Tuck Hardware when we couldn't find it anywhere else and you'd have to wait for Mr. Tuck because he's the only person that knew what was in that store. When they uh, went in and was cleaning out his business, that, uh, of course, they found old buggies that were in boxes that had never been put together, but they found dynamite too, boxes of dynamite. So they had to call a, the military in uh, to, to dispose of that dynamite, you know, enough to, he said enough to blow up half his block or more probably. The dockets actually served uh, the black and some of the white community for many, many years down there. Well, there was time persons would come in, and I know, and they actually didn't have the money, and they would actually just, you know, just give them stuff, things that they needed, but they couldn't afford them. Uh, everybody just about had an account with them, and they paid it when they could. And uh, he was, very helpful in the community. I remember when uh, we needed a school bus at Douglas, he and some other uh, businessmen were very in instrumental in helping us to get a bus. The parades filled the bottom to the top. People would surround the bands as they would march down West Jackson Street. They would start dancing in the streets and on the sidewalks. always have our own Miss Douglas and all our queens and floats and that was interesting. Good, and especially football players would be on that. It was, it was really nice and the cheerleaders would march on there and we would decorate our floats and it was beautiful. The majorettes and all of them was really good when they get down in the bottom and that's when they said they would really show out down in the bottom. I remember that. <laughs> the parades weren't the only form of entertainment in the bottom. The hub for so much activity at the bottom was the Rich Theater. It was owned by Nat Williams and managed by Eddie Lightsey. He operated many theaters for Nat Williams. The anti-Lightsey family helped out. It was, it was very vital for the community because it provided a lot of opportunity for jobs. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of kids my age and a little older. Uh, my dad employed them, you know, to serve behind the concession stand and sell tickets. Uh, I asked to work the concession stand and sold tickets in 
projectionist. On Saturdays, many people from the rural areas came to the bottom to shop. The parents would drop off their children at the Rich Theater, and Michael Lightsey said that his mom would look out for the small children in the theater. She'd be sure they would. She'd be sure they didn't run around and and uh, aggravate the other the other moviegoers and have them make them sit down. And you know, I've even seen her, the ones that didn't didn't bring concession money. She's giving them concessions because concessions was was real concessions back then. We had milkshakes and hot dogs and hamburgers and french fries and full service, not like today. You pay 15 cents to come in and you make and do the concession stand twice with a quarter. And we had this, uh, like a lobby upstairs just before you went into the balcony, uh, up to the balcony, and there was a couple of seats up there. Well, you get some guys they would pay, but they'd just go in there, stand around, and that was their little meeting place. And they'd just stand around and talk. They wasn't causing a problem. Not only did we they have movies, but they had a, a huge stage. Uh, we would have live performances. My, my dad's baby brother, he had a singing group, the Mark IV. They would come perform, and they'd just pack. You know, the house would be packed. Uh, uh, one of our local boxers, Joe Alexander, had an exhibition boxing match. But we were able to go sometimes, and the only thing I remember is that all of the movies were westerns. <laughs> they were all westerns, and what we used to call them was shooter-ups. Shooter you didn't get to see quite a, uh, that many black people in Hollywood, but uh, you would get some of those movies where you would have a, uh, uh, the character would be black, and he would be the hero or the heroine in the movie. And some of them were, uh, as we look back now, a little bit over the top, but uh, not uh, Cleopatra Jones and that kind of stuff uh, with Pam Grier and some of the others, but uh, uh, definitely that one. Uh, I figured you'd remember Pam Grier. Oh, yeah. oh absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. A, a young man of your age. <laughs> and everybody was kind of gathered around the theater on Sundays, and basically all those that didn't go in the theater they would stand outside or sit on their cars. It was, it was just like a meeting place. There were efforts to save the rich theater. It was in bad shape. It was torn down in 1995. In the 1970s, the bottom began to decline. There were local and national reasons for it, and all of downtown was hit hard. Things start changing for the black community. That's when the business, the black man that ran business downtown, because we start running up time to the other bit. We start running to the shopping center. 1963, new US 19 goes to the east of Thomasville. And of course, development started happening around there in what they, it was called the Gateway District. Unending miles of beautiful black concrete paint with yellow stripes on it. Man, that was the American dream in the 1950s and 60s. And I, I don't even think of it as a good thing or a bad thing. It was just a thing. This is my thought, that when the original original owners, the uh, older ones, when they died off, many times their younger ones did not, you know, take that business over and continue with it. They had become deceased or different things, and they were being to the point where, you know, the upkeep of them was not in very good shape. So I noticed the change in them where they was being to the point where they was even, you know, coming in and tearing the buildings down. That was just a part of uh, all the changes that was coming, which was good changes, but it was just the sad part about seeing the all the history part, you know, been torn down. The opportunities for minority businesses to move up on Broad Street weren't there. The opportunities to engage other clients was not there. So I've seen Thomasville trans to make those transitions. And I used to say, okay, well, we've lost all these black businesses, but we've lost white businesses because of Walmart because of 
everything. So it's, we, you know, we try to make everything a black, white thing, but it's this Ecclesiastes. It's the time. And everyone is excited to see the new energy and renovation on West Jackson Street. Progressive communities are constantly experiencing transitions, and perhaps the best we can do is to continue our productive civil dialogue while keeping our eyes on the prize as we Thomas Villians move toward a more fabulous future in our efforts to help form a more perfect union. It has evolved, I think, in a way that kind of left some folk behind. I wish there had been an opportunity for people to say come together and maybe form some joint ventures to do some kinds of things. To me, in a sense, it's a great improvement, but it has lost its identity to what it was back during the 50s and 60s. But I feel like what is happening there is for the better. But how we take care of those that can't take care of themselves is kind of what help writes the story about Thomasville. And for me, traditionally, Thomasville has a good record of trying to do what is right for its citizens on both levels, black and white. You know, I'm just hoping that more of the younger people will be, uh, and I think they are, more interested in having their own businesses, uh, you know, and working for themselves and and uh, being able to uh, manage it and, you know, have ownership of it. But I do think that uh, this was a step in the right direction. Thomasville's future in large part is dependent on homegrown businesses because that has the ripple effect. That's where taxes, taxes are paid by businesses, jobs are provided by businesses. You know, that, that sense of belonging, you know, that, 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 well, I don't know, it's just, it's just totally different now. One of the stories that Nathaniel Abrams has told me was about his mentor, Ben Corbett. It's an example of how businesses can have a real impact by providing livelihoods and investment, but also serving as mentors. Ben Corbett mentored Nathaniel Abrams, who is now mentoring me and others. It doesn't have to do with, with I mean, that's works across racial lines. There's good people, black and white, we all kind of mix and mingle together, and, and that's, that's, uh, that's how West Jackson Street's always operating, you know? All can touch somebody. It don't matter whether or not they come through that door or they out there, in the streets or whatever, but he allows where we can touch him in some form of way and stuff. If it ain't nothing but just saying hello, you know, how are you doing? I'm thankful to live in Thomasville because Thomasville has always been very progressive to a certain degree. I think now if we try to reimagine what Thomasville looks like in the future, we are going to have to imagine a place where everyone's kind of taken care of, where people actually know people more on a personal basis than on a casual basis. And when you develop those kinds of relationships, then you have a community. Uh -huh. oh, okay. On February 10th, 2021, Mr. James Weich, owner of the Busy Bee Cafe, got to see his plaque for the first time. He's in his 90s now, and he's a World War II veteran. He reflected on his time as a black soldier serving with other black soldiers in the bottom of a Navy ship. Thank you, Mr. Weich, for your service, and thank you for helping us all to mend. Mm -hmm. 
was like seeing yeah. your name engraved in the ground. Peter, B. Cafe. James and Patty. Yeah. Hey, I can't read that. I got them reading that. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I love it, love it.